Hi folks, whether you're working your way through the back catalogue still or you're listening to the latest drops, I recommend checking out the latest products that have just been posted in the shop this week. To mark the War of Independence, I've commissioned a limited set of collectible hand-painted pewter figures of Irish revolutionaries. There's three designs, two of Constance Markovich and one of James Connolly. They are limited, so even if you haven't started the War of Independence series yet, check them out at irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop before they're gone. The coming weeks are always a bit of a challenge. It's the business end of winter. The weather is cold and the evenings are dark. You don't want to step outside your front door. You need entertainment to come to you. Now does literally that. I'm sure you probably know the drill with now at this stage. But now is a one-stop shop for entertainment from live sports through to movies and the latest series. They have a huge catalogue. At the moment, I'm really enjoying The Gilded Age. That's one for us history fans. Basically, a Downton Abbey set in the US. You really need to check it out. But now is great no matter what you're into. My list of shows over the next couple of weeks includes their four-part thriller, The Fear Index, and then Space Jam, A New Legacy, which drops on the 11th for something a bit light. So look, it's simple. Don't miss out. Join in and experience must-watch sport, movies, and the latest entertainment on now. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dewar, and this is John Charles McQuaid. A ghost of our Catholic past. Through the mid 20th century, John Charles McQuaid, the Archbishop of Dublin, was one of the most influential people in Ireland. McQuaid has come to symbolise not only the power of the Catholic Church at the time, but also, for many, the abuse of that power. He exerted huge influence over successive Irish governments and was also in a position to censor what films and literature Irish people had access to. However, despite this enormous influence, McQuaid remains a somewhat elusive, even shadowy figure to many. In this episode, I interview Dr. Aoife Vernock, the host of the podcast Censored, about who exactly John Charles McQuaid was and what was his role in Irish history in the mid-20th century. This is the final episode of the show in 2020. Thanks to everyone who has tuned in throughout what has been a very strange year, to say the least. I would particularly like to thank all of you who have supported the podcast on Patreon or through my website. Back in March, when the pandemic began, I was genuinely fearful the show might not survive the economic fallout. But thanks to your generosity, we have not only come through 2020, but I have also been able to draw up an exciting plan for 2021. On February 1st, the series on the War of Independence begins, and this will be my largest project to date. This 24-part podcast series will be released weekly and adopt a similar structure to my series on the Great Famine by telling the story of the conflict through the lives of those involved. While this series starts on February the 1st, the show will return on January the 11th with a mini-series about emigrants in the US. Tune in in early January for that. Now to the interview about John Charles McQuaid with Dr Aoife Vernock. You might remember Aoife was on the show earlier this year in the episode From Cork to Bermuda, An Irish Woman's Life in the British Army. Now, while many of you are probably already listening to Aoife's podcast, Censored, I asked her to explain it because it's a really fascinating show. The podcast, Censored, that I'm running is about books that were banned by the Irish censor. And they were banned forever in Ireland. And these books are banned because they're either indecent or obscene. And they're the two words from the legislation. And it's just great fun seeing the different range of books that come up and why they were banned. We we don't know why they were banned. That's the whole point of the podcast. It's a guessing game. It's like retrospectively trying to work out why the censor banned the books. They didn't actually have to tell anyone why they banned. They didn't have to give detailed reasons. So nobody knows. Um, So it's just historical guessing game, really. Don't forget to check out Censored and subscribe at the end of the show. Now to John Charles McQuaid. Aoife started by explaining who exactly McQuaid was. John Charles McQuaid is really famous as Archbishop of Dublin. um, And he's known, I suppose, now as the biggest bogeyman in Catholic Ireland in the 20th century. But he was born in Cavan in 1895. And he went to primary school in Cavan until he went to secondary school in Dublin. Um, And after he finished his education, he entered the Holy Ghost Fathers 
who had educated him in Black Rock College. And so he progresses to become a priest in 1924 and subsequently teaches in Black Rock College. There's a very famous anecdote that he was teaching Eamon de Valera's son, Vivian de Valera, and actually brought him into the into his office to have a conversation with him and was showing him the newspaper. And in the newspaper, there are these ads for various either uh, medicine like cod liver oil or clothes. And the clothes and the medicines have little sketch portraits. And apparently McQuaid pointed out that the sketch portraits of the ladies' clothing was potentially indecent and, you know, needed to to be censored. And these are just pen portraits of people in clothing. But there is a suggestion of the female body within them. And so he's he's pretty uptight about things like that. Um, but even as in his time there as a Holy Ghost father in Black Rock, he still has a great deal of power because Eamon de Valera talks to him about the 1937 Constitution. So even when he's not a very powerful member of the hierarchy, he still has great influence over the foundational document of our current Irish state. The fact he enjoyed influence at what was an early stage in his career surprised me, and I asked Aoife why this was the case. She identified his role as a teacher in Black Rock College as being central to this. Uh, Eamon de Valera is himself an alumnus of that school, and his children are going there. So there's that personal connection. Um, there's no doubting that McQuaid is an extremely clever person, and he's a very able uh, administrator and very sharp. So he has both the the ability that de Valera would see and also he's a personal connection and it's a handy representative of a church voice and de Valera would have been quite eager to see what a church voice would say about his constitution. McQuaid became Archbishop of Dublin in 1940 and Aoife explained why this position in particular made him an incredibly powerful figure. So he's made Archbishop in 1940. Um, And one of the things that his one of his brothers said is the first person he told was his mother. He wrote a letter to his mother to say that he had been appointed. Uh, I have seen people say online and kind of casual throwaway comments that de Valera asked the hierarchy to appoint McQuaid as as Archbishop. I think that's quite a preposterous suggestion in that I don't think de Valera or anybody can tell the Catholic bishops what to do and more to the point what Rome would like to do. Um, So it's not as close a relationship as that. It's not that easy to stereotype. Uh, he's, He's promoted, I suppose, mostly because he is a strong minded and a very conservative figure within the hierarchy. And it's easier to promote those type of people than to promote anyone with slightly uh, more left of field views. He's based in Dublin and Dublin is at this point one of the most powerful uh, dioceses within the Catholic Church. Most people will know that actually the Irish Catholic Church is technically administered from Armagh across the border in Northern Ireland. And that's true. That is the actual seat of power officially. But in truth, Dublin is the most powerful diocese in the country because it's the seat of government and it's the the largest city in the state. So really, to get Dublin, you do have to live and work in Dublin. And he had for a long time before his appointment. As we will hear later in the interview, McQuaid used the position to exert enormous influence over the lives of the Irish people and women in particular. Before we get into the specific ways he did this, I asked Aoife if he had a plan or a vision he wanted to implement when he was appointed as Archbishop. I don't think that he reacts to politics. I think he knows his own mind. He's a very strong-minded and stubborn individual, really. The reason he accumulates so much power is because he has a plan. That sort of thing doesn't happen by accident. You don't become... Uh, so central to so much in government policy if you don't put yourself out there. And he did have a plan. His plan primarily was the representation of the Catholic Church at all aspects of life, that everything around the state would be geared to ensuring that Catholic morals and values were respected and enforced. That's his 
big vision, if you want to put it like that. On a more local level, he has a lot of plans about uh, the creation of charity within the diocese. So he does do a lot of work in creating new structures within the diocese to administer funds to people in need. So he has plans on his local diocesan level, but on a more general level, uh, on the progress of the Catholic Church and its place within the state and within the society. Has Archbishop Ife explained his power derived in part from the fact that he operated a network of informants? This allowed him to adopt a proactive approach in intervening in issues he did not like or agree with while they were still only being planned. Indeed, this led to one of his more notorious interventions in Irish life when he stopped Tampax tampons being sold in Ireland. McQuaid ran quite an extraordinary network of information that he funneled uh, from all sorts of different people and different organisations that he received the end products of. So he's like, if you want to use that metaphor, he's like the spider at the centre of the web. There's a lot of information comes his way. And he marshals all sorts of organisations that people may know but don't know were feeding information to McQuaid. Say, for example, the Knights of Columbanus, which are a lay organisation. And it's mostly, it, it is an all-male organisation and it's very middle class. And these are men who are teachers, school principals, bank officials, civil servants, working at all those kinds of levels of managerial and administrative power in Dublin and in Ireland, in fact. So he uses that sort of organisation to acquire information on what's going to happen. And one of the most notorious ones that he does is in relation to Tampax in 1944. And it seems like a hilarious story. He learns that Tampax is about to be sold in pharmacies in Dublin, where it hadn't been sold for a number of years. And so he exercises his authority to prevent it being sold because he believes that Tampax, you know, is bad for women in some some way because, of course, maybe they might like using a tampon or something like that. I mean, it's very, it's very ridiculous. It makes no sense now. And it seems just kind of silly. You're like, really? He objects to Tampax? But of course, it has profound effects on women's lives. But apart from that, that story shows that the information he received about the pharmacy was funneled through a doctor who was a member of the Knights of Columbanus. And as a senior member, as a senior knight, he had been told that by someone else. So you can see how it all is filtered through to McQuaid. He wouldn't have known about Tampax and pharmacies until they had arrived if someone didn't tell him that they were planning to be sold. And I think that makes that silly little story that we can all laugh at and be like, oh, so sad that anyone would object to Tampax. The point isn't that he objected to Tampax. The point is that he knew what pharmacies were about to sell and he was able to stop them selling it. The only reason he knew is because someone told him. And that's, I think, the story about incidents like that. They're very revealing and they show the power that he could have because he had a lot of information. His opposition to something called the mother and child scheme is often cited today as an example of his conservatism. Aoife explained what exactly this was and how McQuaid intervened. So the mother and child scheme was trying to extend maternity care to postnatal women. Uh, Maternity care available on the state, that is. Of course, if you were a private patient, you could always pay for anything you wanted. But this was to extend a social welfare maternity care to women uh, six weeks after birth that they could go to a doctor and receive care for themselves and the infant six weeks after birth. Seems a relatively uncomplicated kind of thing and also would be very useful in trying to reduce the infant mortality rate, which at this time, uh, Noel Brown came up with the scheme in 1950, 1951. The infant mortality rate in Ireland is significantly higher than it is in the UK at this time. So children are dying very young in a way that they didn't have to in other countries. So it seems like a great idea to reform this. But it runs into opposition almost immediately. And 
one of the most important opponents of it is in fact the medical profession who don't want the system to change because it allows women to make a choice of their doctor. And there's always this conflict between public and private practice in the Irish medical system. And this is one of the first big fights over it. McQuaid takes the doctor's side and backs their opposition. He is himself a doctor's son. So you can see that there is a personal connection there. But on a broader level, he doesn't want the state being involved in people's personal lives too much. He has this belief that, you know, the state should be as hands off as possible and that in social service terms, the church is the best one to deliver social care in any matter. But I think particularly anything to do with reproduction is just going to press all his buttons. There is always a deep anxiety within the hierarchy that women will get control of their bodies and that they will make decisions about their reproductive care. And that's their constant fear and their lodestone throughout the 20th century. I mean, at this point, there is no freely available contraception. It's not legally available. You know, middle class people or those with connections can certainly secure contraception. And there's evidence that they do. But if you don't know where to look and you don't know how to find it, you won't get it. And McQuaid doesn't want to change that sort of system. And he sees something like the mother and child scheme as a possible broadening of choice in maternity care. And choice has always been a dirty word for people like McQuaid in relation to reproductive choice in Ireland. If you have a TV, you must have a TV license. It's the law. Make your payments easy with yearly, twice yearly, quarterly or monthly direct debits. See tvlicense.ie for more. Your TV license made easier. Brought to you by the Government of Ireland. Want to know where Stenaline could take you this year? From school runs to road trips. From FaceTime to face-to-face time. Get away from the everyday and we'll take care of everything else. Take your car to Britain and France from only €139 Euros car and driver one way. And if you upgrade to our Flexi Fair, if your plans change, so can your ticket. Book today at stenaline.ie. Terms and conditions apply. Both his opposition to the mother and child scheme and tampons raises questions about his general attitude to women. There's no doubt that women were heavily discriminated against in general in Ireland in the mid-20th century, but I was curious if McQuaid shaped these attitudes or rather that he was shaped by what were already existing views. I think McQuaid is an important enforcer of the attitudes towards gender and towards sexuality. And he's a very powerful and influential figure in disseminating these ideas. But he certainly isn't the architect of those ideas. They have existed. They existed long before the state. I mean, the idea of people snooping on you and knowing your business and enforcing your private life through public shame is expressed in a book called The Valley of Squinting Windows, which predates the foundation of the state. And that's a phrase people like to use, the valley of squinting windows, I mean, the curtain twitching nosiness that keeps everybody in check, particularly around areas of sexual morality. So all that gossip culture, he didn't have anything to do with that. That was already there. And some of the architecture of confinement that we talk about now, say the mother and baby homes, the mother and baby homes that are very famous, for example, like Bespra, that's founded before McQuaid is even ordained a priest and is founded as part of the reform of the hospital system by the new state and by Republicans in the new state. So it's very difficult to blame McQuaid for that particular one. Bishops are heavily involved in all of these things, but these government structures can only happen if government agrees. And so BESPRA only happens because the government are willing to pay for it and set it up. The bishop helps, but he doesn't create the system. And in Dublin, there are various adoption agencies and mother and baby homes that are there from about 1910 and that have nothing to do with McQuaid. 
as in the establishment of them. Of course, once he's archbishop, he closely supervises what's happening and he monitors what's going on. But by no means does he create the system. He runs it very well when he has his chance. But it is not McQuaid's fault that we have mother and baby homes, I'm afraid. You can blame him for a lot of things, but you really can't blame him for that much. McQuaid also considered many books and films dangerous, and he went to considerable lengths to have them censored. Certainly in the 50s, McQuaid is incredibly influential in the composition of the censorship board and therefore in what gets passed through the censorship board. So there's uh, Father Deary is chair of the censorship board in the early 50s, and he absolutely pushes McQuaid's agenda, chief of which is that he hates what we now call pulp fiction. So if you think of those really lurid book covers, you know, where everything is where all the ladies are bursting out of their, their shirts and the men are all ripped and it's all very glossy and they're, it's beautiful art. And they had titles like I read one for the podcast, which was called Pleasure Ground, which as far as I could tell, the title had no relationship to the actual topics, but it sounds sexy and it had a naked lady on the front cover and, you know, a manly bloke in the background. And McQuaid hated these books. They're extremely cheap. They represent a a reading revolution in the Western world because they're like the price of a packet of cigarettes. And in America and the UK, they're on sale in the train stations and the news agents. And they also issue like classics, like George Orwell's 1984 was released as a pulp. So it will have a glossy cover and maybe people might read the classics that way too. So he hated these books. Um, and believed that they would, you know, rot the nation's soul. And Father Deary, in charge of the censorship board, made absolutely sure he banned as many of them as possible. I mean, the number of pulp books banned is phenomenal. Some of the big authors, like Hank Jensen, about 35 of his books were banned. And that's only the ones I've found. I mean, because the, the list, of course, isn't ordered according to author. It's by date of banning. So... You'd have to go through year after year after year. But Hank Jansen had 35. There was another uh, pulp noir crime writer called Day Keen. About 15 of his books were banned. I mean, it's just, it was a blanket ban on pulp fiction. And that is directly traceable to McQuaid. And it affects people who aren't literary readers. Like one of the things about censorship that's famous in Ireland is that we banned all of the big guys and women, but mostly guys. You know, we banned Beckett, we banned O'Fueloin, we banned O'Connor, we banned one or two Joyce, you know, like the really famous works. But a lot of people don't read big books and they don't read very serious literature, but they will read cheap throwaway fiction for the laugh. And so by banning all of these cheap books, he meant that people who just wanted to read for pleasure, for diversion, for no great, you know, moral or artistic endeavor, they couldn't get those books. So you could say legitimately that it it stunted the reading habits of generations of people who were not elite readers. McQuaid's power derived from the fact that he was a Catholic prelate. However, this begs the question, how he related to the rest of the Irish population who were not Catholic McQuaid's attitude to people who aren't Catholics is that they should really be as insignificant as possible, I think, in his conceptualization of what the Catholic state is trying to do, a state that takes account of the Catholic Church. Now, at the same time, every time the state takes account of churches, it often adds in a rider, you know, that we also include Protestant churches in this Um, So, for example, legislation around adoption, uh, it was that, you know, Catholic children couldn't be adopted by non-Catholics. But it was also then included that Protestant children or other children of Protestant mothers couldn't be adopted by people who weren't Protestant. So both sides are attempting to, you know, cover their backs in this. Um, But McQuaid is partially responsible for that piece in the Constitution Uh, which is now deleted, which said that the Catholic Church had a special place 
in the life of the nation. So you can see that, you know, it's a very preeminent, his opinion is that the Catholic Church, as it represents the overwhelming majority, is really the most important one. And he is, like most of the bishops, a very enthusiastic advocate of ne temere, which meant that when a Catholic and Protestant married, that it was only on the proviso that any children would be raised Catholic. So he would have made sure that that was enforced. But then that was all bishops were part of that and all of their clergy helped to enforce that. Now, from the standpoint of 2020, John Charles McQuaid is representative of an Ireland that is very difficult to relate to today. However, major change was already underway during his lifetime. I asked Aoife if even in the early 1970s, while he was still Archbishop, if he seemed like a relic of the past. By the time McQuaid resigns in 1972, the public media opinion of his life's work is that he's terribly old-fashioned and he really needs to go. Like, he's just considered, within the pages of the newspaper, certainly, he's very much portrayed as a dinosaur at that point. Um, There is a certain amount of bitterness towards him. But that's just the newspapers. It's hard to know whether that represents, you know, people beyond the chattering classes. Certainly when he died and he was laid out, they estimated about 58,000 people filed past his remains to pay their respects, which is really quite significant. So for all that he was old-fashioned and out of touch by the time he died, people obviously still felt something for him. I mean, the biggest bone of contention in a modernization sense is that he didn't like Vatican II. And Vatican II was from 1962 to 65 and is a series of reforms in which the Latin mass is replaced by the language of a country. Um, There's greater lay participation in the mass, and there's greater lay participation in the administration of the church. And he didn't like any of that. He was a traditionalist, and he didn't believe that lay people should become part of the church in these new ways. He probably felt it as a challenge to clerical authority and to his own authority. So that certainly caused a lot of tension within the diocese. And that may have been part of the reason people were cross at him by 1972, because he maintained that opposition. You know, so that's like 10 years after the reform started. But on a kind of more general level, I mean, outside of administration of the church, he started to lose grip around, certainly around the mid 60s in a cultural sense. Um, People are talking about contraception more openly, increasingly. By the late 60s, you find columns in the paper by priests talking about contraception, where they're interviewed by journalists, and they will talk about contraception. Now, at this point, it's still illegal. So it does show that there has been a great cultural shift, even while he's still in charge of the Archdiocese of Dublin. So he does lose, he does become sidelined culturally, I think. And that really starts around 1957. He lost control of the censorship board in 1957. So he is beginning to be slowly pushed out uh, of some of the more important uh, power positions that he occupied. Given he was so influential over Irish society through the mid-20th century, I wanted to get Aoife's view of McQuaid's legacy today. I think McQuaid's legacy now is hard to distinguish from his persona as the baddest bishop we ever had. You know, he's become he's become a mythical beast that we love to hate, much like De Valera, actually. De Valera, McQuaid and the 1937 Constitution are like the unholy trinity of oppression as we see them now. Um, So he's become quite stereotyped and caricatured, not that he wasn't in his own way quite an arrogant and sanctimonious individual. I'm not saying he was a nice person, but I do think we have tended to overstate his great power um, and to conceal how that power came from. And it came from everybody who gave it to him. I mean, one of the things that McGaharan, John McGaharan said, and he was a victim of McQuaid in a censorship row. He said, we get the church we deserve. And I think that McQuaid reflects the Irish Catholic Church at a very particular time. Certainly when he died, there was great changes happening within the church. 
And so his legacy at that time was maybe less obvious in that caricatured sense. Obviously, the subsequent archbishops have never been as charismatic or dangerous in a sense. So he remains one of the most interesting and compelling ones just because of the time that he was in and how he was able to administer so much from that palace. Sean O'Casey called him the Archdruid of Drumcondra as he sat there writing letters. He was extremely powerful in the way that he could communicate with so many people and his work rate was phenomenal. You know, he got involved in everything, everything he could get involved in. And I think that was the key to his power, was his ability to be part of every small decision if needed, if it suited him. Finally, I asked Eva what's coming up in her podcast, Censored in 2021. Censored in 2021 is just going to be brilliant. I'm starting uh, in January, in the first week of January, and I'm going to talk about Madonna's book, Sex which was published in 1992. Now, a lot of people will actually remember this censorship controversy. And I'm quite excited because it's the first censorship controversy where I was actually conscious and noted it at the time. So that's going to be absolutely brilliant. Um, I've got some great guests lined up to talk about The Well of Loneliness, which is a famous book from 1928. And it's going to emphasize a lot more of the transgender aspects of that book, which is really exciting because I previously thought of it as a lesbian Bible. So that's going to be interesting. And I'm going to do a deep dive into John McGahern's book, The Dark, because it is a huge scandal from 1965 to 67. And it involves a lot about John Charles McQuaid, who actually fired McGahern after he was censored. So there's going to be a lot around that dynamic period in the late 60s and censorship. So it's going to be great fun. Don't forget to check out Censored wherever you listen to podcasts. All that's left for me to do in 2020 is to wish you a happy Christmas, whatever way you spend it. I'll talk to you in January 2021 to start what will hopefully be a better year. Until next time, Sloan. The coming weeks are always a bit of a challenge. It's the business end of winter. The weather is cold and the evenings are dark. You don't want to step outside your front door. You need entertainment to come to you. Now does literally that. I'm sure you probably know the drill with now at this stage. But now is a one-stop shop for entertainment from live sports through to movies and the latest series. They have a huge catalogue. At the moment, I'm really enjoying The Gilded Age. That's one for us history fans. Basically, a Downton Abbey set in the US. You really need to check it out. But now is great no matter what you're into. My list of shows over the next couple of weeks includes their four-part thriller, The Fear Index, and then Space Jam, A New Legacy, which drops on the 11th for something a bit light. So look, it's simple. Don't miss out. Join in and experience must-watch sport, movies and the latest entertainment on now. Hi folks, whether you're working your way through the back catalogue still or you're listening to the latest drops, I recommend checking out the latest products that have just been posted in the shop this week. To mark the War of Independence, I've commissioned a limited set of collectible hand-painted pewter figures of Irish revolutionaries. There's three designs, two of Constance Markovich and one of James Connolly. They are limited, so even if you haven't started the War of Independence series yet, check them out at irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop before they're gone.